Tonight's guest is Ben. Ben, welcome to the show. Hey, Vic. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for coming on. We appreciate your time. Ben, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Yeah, so my name is Ben. Just turned 32 years old. I'm from northern Indiana, but I've spent a lot of time in southern Indiana as well. So I've got pretty much all the outdoors experiences with, you know, being wintertime, being summertime, and all parts of the state. I uh, grew up in a tiny town. Uh, it was about two brick roads and maybe 500 people. So I didn't, you know, have too many friends in my town growing up. So I spent a lot of time by myself or you know, I'd ride my bike to the local gravel pit. Uh, you could do some fishing out there. And Not to interrupt you there, Ben, but I'm hearing a bunch of noise in the background. Are you fidgeting with anything? No, it's probably the fireworks just start going crazy now. Oh, okay. I see. Well, sorry to interrupt you. Please continue. Oh, no, that's fine. I spent a lot of time by myself, you know, and like in the outdoors and things like that. Played a lot of sports uh, and stuff. You know, and I had a sister that was a few years older than me. So we spent a lot of time together. But when it came to friends and things that small, on the weekends and stuff, I'd go spend the night at a buddy's house or whatever. But, you know, during the week, it was pretty much just me and uh, the outdoors. So I'm no stranger, you know, to the outdoors ever since I was little hunting, fishing, you know, walking around in the woods, just hanging out, being outdoors. Because back in my day, that was just the beginning of all the game councils and computers and stuff like that. So we had it. It was just I was already more accustomed to being outdoors and, and that kind of thing. You just mentioned some of the outdoors experiences you've had. Don't forget that dogman encounter, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. When you told me about your encounter for the first time, Ben, I was afraid you were going to blow a gasket. You were so worked up, you are talking a mile a minute. How are you feeling now about it? Is it any easier to think about? Yeah, definitely. It's, it feels a lot easier and, and it's not as hard to talk about. Uh, like I would mentioned to you, I have asthma. So when my asthma starts to kick in, I start getting you know overworked and worked up and things like that. But it's very rare that that happens just from talking. It's usually if I'm overexerting myself or if it's just really hot outside, humid, things like that. When it came to that, when I was talking about that experience, because you're the only person other than my parents and my wife that I'd even told about it. I'd mentioned a few things to some people over the years, but I'd never went into detail. I just said, oh, yeah, I had a weird experience with something, you know, one time. And that was about it because I didn't want people to start the old, oh, he's crazy. You know, what's, what's he talking about? This and that. But, yeah, it definitely got me a little worked up talking to you that night but what we talked about and the things that we discussed i had always thought that in the back of my head but just you know hearing somebody else say the same thing just makes it that much more reassuring so uh definitely did help and it's a lot easier to talk about now i'm not saying that i don't get worked up about it now i just don't think it'll be to the level that i was the other night and i don't know if i mentioned this to you or not when we were talking the other night actually right when I started getting really worked up, it was weird because after I was done talking to you, my nose just started bleeding out of nowhere. And I don't know why it was bleeding or if it had anything to do with it, but I just thought that was kind of weird. Wow. That is strange. Had it ever done that before? No, I mean, I've had nosebleeds before, but not just random nosebleeds like that. It's very rare that I have a nosebleed. Wow. Yeah, that is weird. Well, hope it doesn't happen again. Yeah, I mean, neither. Yeah, hopefully it won't. You just told us how you haven't really shared that experience with many people, but for the people you did tell about it, who surprised you most with how they responded? Probably my mom, actually, because I told both my parents, I don't know what brought it up, but I think we were actually talking about one of my buddies that was with me that night. We had just started talking about a few things, and I told him about, you know, we were fishing one night. I said, we heard something, and my dad was like, well, what would you guys hear? And I kind of went into the story and, and told him about it. I was expecting both of them to be like, oh, you're crazy. It was just a this or it was that, or you're just freaking yourself out. And my mom kind of, the way she responded was like, oh, yeah, I believe it. Like, you know, I'm not surprised. I kind of asked her, like, have you heard about stuff in that area? And she's like, oh, I've heard of a few different stories of something being seen, whether it was a dog man or Bigfoot. She didn't know. She had just heard stories. And my dad gave the response I was expecting from both of them. And he just basically, oh, it was it was a dog or it was a pig or something. You know, it was you're just hearing things. You were working yourself up. 
and stuff like that, which is what I expected from both of them. But that's kind of the response that I got from him. And then when, you know, my mother had said she had heard stories and things of, of stuff in that area, he was like, you know, gave her the old, well, where did you hear that? You know, when was this? I, I never heard about that kind of thing. My mom's, I think, more open to knowing that those things are out there. And my dad believes that things are out there like that as well. He's just more of the, you know, it's out in the middle of the 3,000 square foot forest where nobody ever goes to and doesn't believe that they can be in your backyard. Well, I'm glad your mom responded the way she did at least. Yeah, it was it was surprising and somewhat comforting. Yeah, thank goodness for that. Yeah, it, it did help thinking, at least my mom doesn't think I'm crazy about this. <laughs> yeah, that always helps. You told me in our first conversation that the show makes you anxious. If that's the case, why do you listen? Well, there's different levels to my anxiety and things. I think the bad anxiety part that I get with it is just, you know, when I close my eyes and think, like, and picture my experience. But I think overall it's more beneficial than it is harmful because it makes me realize there's all these other people that have had similar or somewhat close experiences. So one, that makes me realize, okay, I, I can't be that crazy. Two, if there's all these people, there's all these witnesses, there's all these stories, everybody that has a story has lived to tell it. So it just hits the point what you say. If it wanted to hurt you, it would have. And then that makes me just kind of think more about it. That really lowers my anxiety level when I realize it was just an experience. It was just scaring me. If it wanted to hurt me, it would have. That kind of helps me with the anxiety and with the the worry and things like that, just hearing all these other people that were way closer than me, that had them dead to rights, way closer than I was, but yet they are here to tell their story about it. So I think hearing it, it just reassures me that I'm not crazy. I'm not the only one. It just makes me feel better knowing that, that it didn't hurt all of these people. Oh, definitely. Yeah, it's intent. That's all that matters. Doesn't matter how terrifying it was to look at or anything like that. If it didn't want to hurt you, nothing else matters. Exactly. If you've had a dog man encounter and would like to talk with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. If you've had a Sasquatch sighting and would like to be a guest on one of my two Bigfoot shows, please go to mybigfootsighting.com and let me know. All right, Ben, please tell us about your encounter now. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. All right, so it was about June... I'd say right around mid-June. This was in, let's see, 2007. I mean, a few of my friends that evening, we were playing basketball in my, in not my hometown. My hometown was too small for that, but the town closer to us in Warsaw, Indiana, there's a basketball court and they had it open to the public until I think it was like 10 or 11 at night. They would shut the lights off and that was, man, it would be time to go. So there's a, a group of us, you know, we were playing maybe eight, 10 of us. And me and two of my other friends, we had plans to go fishing. Well, there's this place that we would always go night fishing at. It was nice because it was, you know, seclusive. Nobody would go back there. It was private property. You weren't even supposed to be back there. So it was nice because there was a seawall. You know, people caught catfish out there all the time. We didn't have to worry about other people being there. So we figured that we would go out there. And we had been there before throughout the years. It's just a little town up the street from where I grew up. It's just another tiny drop in the bucket town called Oswego, Indiana. Growing up, I had a buddy that lived there. We went to the same elementary school, so I would go there quite a bit. And we would usually go there during the daytime and go fishing. There's a road, and I believe it's the post office, back from when the town was first established. And you take that road, and there's a few houses on each side of the road. Then you go down, and there's a graveyard. I don't know what it's called. It's like Oswego Cemetery, something like that. Well, there's the all the headstones and everything, and then it goes back to a little fence. I'd say probably about three feet tall, just a little fence basically to, to divide the properties. And behind that is an Indian burial ground. Now, I don't know the actual history behind it, the facts and everything like that. I know for 100% fact that there was Indians that lived back there, and it was an Indian area just because of the name Oswego. We would find arrowheads back there and stuff. And it was very, you know, historical around that area for Indians being in that area. When I was younger, we would go back there and go fishing or try to catch some crawdads, things like that, or just go back there just to play around because it was creepy and we thought it was cool. 
that was back, you know, years and years ago when I was younger, uh, way younger. But anyway, we were going to go out there that night. So we got done playing basketball. We decided we needed to go to Walmart to get some bait and we needed some more sinkers and things like that. And this is back when Walmart was still 24 seven. So we went to Walmart. I'd say we got there probably around 11, 1130. Uh, I just can't remember if it was 10 or 11 when the basketball courts shut down. But we went there and got, you know, the stink bait and we got some other stuff and some drinks and stuff for the night, some Gatorades and uh sinkers and we headed out and we were in my buddy's s10 we got in there and i was sitting in the back because my friend i'll refer to him as jay he was the driver and then my other friend d he was the passenger who is like six foot eight and at the time almost 400 pounds so there was no way he was sitting in the back of the s10 so i got to sit in the back we headed out i'd say we got to the spot at around 11 30 almost midnight and where we parked at my friend d his aunt actually lived up the street she lived where that old post office building that i was talking about where it was at i'd say if you came back down the road probably about four or five houses she lived right there actually off of the channel uh, so we would park there and then walk down because we didn't want to park at the cemetery we didn't know if you know cops would drive by or somebody would report the car And we didn't want to park on the street for the same reason, because it's a small, tiny town. If people see a car parked, it's usually always, you know, up for suspicion. So we parked the car and headed back there. And the only way to get back there was to go down that road and then through the cemetery, over the fence, through the Indian burial ground. So it was always somewhat creepy walking through there at night, you know, especially when it's pitch black out and it's quiet and it's just you and a couple of your buddies and you're walking through a cemetery. Well, the scariest part is walking through the Indian burial ground. So you would go over the fence, like I said, about three foot high, going from the cemetery to the Indian burial site. And, you know, one of us would climb over and then grab the other guy's stuff and let him get over and, and help each other out. And then you'd have to walk back, I'd say probably 30 yards, if that, 20 maybe, and to another fence that led to a property. Well, when you go over the other side of the fence, there's a seawall. So the fence butts up right against the seawall. So the only way to get to the property is by going over the fence, under the fence, or coming up to it by water. The seawall, for those that don't know what a seawall is, it's like, so on this particular lake that bled into a channel that bled into a river, it's basically just a concrete wall that goes around the water, goes around you know the property. So that way it doesn't get the water up in the yard and flood out and things. It's supposed to help prevent that. Well, from the top of the seawall to the water, I would say it was about a foot and a half, two feet. So you could sit on the seawall and you could have your legs in the water and things like that. And you wouldn't have to worry about getting wet unless the water is really high. So we walked through the cemetery. We got over the fence, got back onto the property. And when you get up to the property in the the Indian burial site, there's some trees and some woods and things. And then once you kind of get out of that, there's a clearing, which is a yard. And then looking out of the yard, you just see Oswego Lake. And then all the way around the property is the seawall. So to the right, you see a fence, the seawall, and then the lake. The property is all like on a round. It's rounded. So when you walk up, you go around it, and you go all the way over to the far side. And there's a channel, pretty long channel. At that part of the channel, it's the very beginning of the channel. So it's pretty narrow. I'd say it's about five to seven feet wide maybe only about two or three feet deep and then it goes to where it widens up and it's a little bit bigger of a channel that's actually where my friend d's aunt lived was on that side of the channel and that ends up bleeding into the tippecanoe river so we would go basically to the point of the property which was on the seawall and then directly behind us there was a house and then there was a detached garage kind of behind the house well I'd been out there many, many times from the time I was probably seven, eight years old. The house was completely boarded up, nailed shut. There was no way to get into it. It was condemned and and basically just blocked off, signs posted, no trespassing. But it was weird because there was still a car in the garage with plates from 1972. And when I was younger, I never, never even really wondered about it. Didn't nothing ever crossed my mind. I thought it was an old house that was abandoned. Well, when I got a little bit older, one of my buddy's moms actually told us, you guys shouldn't go out to that property. Something bad happened there. 
years and years ago. Uh, they say it's cursed. You know, you shouldn't be back there. And, you know, once we got a little bit older, I thought about it one time when I was around her and I asked her, you know, Hey, you know, when you were telling us about that house in Oswego, you know, you said something bad had happened there. Like, what, what were you talking about? And I was probably 14, 13 at this time, maybe. And then she proceeded to tell me that back in 1972, there was a man, and I believe it was two sons and his wife. I know it was two kids. I'm not sure if they were both sons or if there's a son and daughter or what, what it was. But it was a you know, murder-suicide. He killed his children and his wife and then killed himself. And apparently after that, nobody would buy the house. People were scared of the property. They thought it was cursed and this and that. So they basically, uh, I'm assuming, cleaned everything up and then just condemned it, boarded it up, and nailed it shut. Every time that we would go out there, it was always boards over and you know, just nails, everything. No way to get inside that house. There was no like cellar doors or basement doors, anything like that. There was a front door and a back door and then some windows. So there was no way to get inside that house. We would always check it just because we didn't know, you know, if there's somebody homeless that was out there or if somebody bought the house. We just didn't want to be out there and then all of a sudden be in trouble or in a situation that we didn't want to be in. So we uh, set everything down in the spots that we would sit at while we fished and we checked around the house. You know, sure enough, we had our, our mag lights so we could see very clearly everything was shut. All the windows, all the doors were closed. They were boarded up, nailed shut. We even tried opening them. There was no way inside that house. We get in our spots and we're fishing and we, uh, we have a few bites. My friend Jay, at the time, we had been friends for probably about three years or so. We had met once we got to middle schools and our uh, middle schools like merged into a bigger school. That's how we met. And my friend D, we actually, we had been friends since we were, I was probably six and he was about five. He's always been at least a foot taller than me my whole life. So even though he was younger than me, he was always the big guy and the one that everybody's worried about. We were out there and I was in the middle. Uh, I was on the point. And then to my left was Jay and to my right was D. Probably about two o'clock, we're sitting there and we had caught a few, you know, by that time. And my friend Jay was wanting to go. Me and D were like, no, you know, let's stick around for a little bit. And then an hour passed by. I think we had caught a few more at that point. And it's about three o'clock. Jay says, well, maybe, maybe we should pack up and leave. And me and D, I mean, we will fish till the sun comes up. So we're like, let's give it another hour. Let's see if we catch anything. If we don't catch anything within the next hour, then we'll leave. So I'd say probably about 20, 30 minutes goes by. And none of us had really you know, been talking, hadn't said anything. We hadn't gotten any bites. I didn't realize it at the time. I didn't think anything of it. but. Uh, looking back on it now, I remember it being so quiet. I remember that we hadn't spoken for probably 15, 20, 30 minutes. And I just remember it being very quiet and eerie, but I wasn't really thinking of anything at the time. I just thought it was just late. You know, all of a sudden I hear, you know, when it's just like super silent and you just hear that ringing, like kind of a ringing noise. I hear that ringing noise. And then all of a sudden, the loudest scream I've ever heard in my life just starts screaming and it, it's like a a scream like a bark it's guttural and like snarling it sounded like a like a wild hog mixed with a rottweiler and a lady like just screaming at the top of their lungs and i remember when it first started happening i couldn't move i was just locked literally frozen i couldn't move i couldn't turn my head i couldn't move my eyeballs i was just looking straight ahead into the pitch blackness into where the trees were off of the lake. And I just remember just hearing this just God awful scream. It just gave me chills. And I was just literally terrified and I was frozen. I was stuck. I could not move. I don't know how long it went on. It could have been two minutes. It could have been 10 minutes. I can't even recreate the sound that it let off. I couldn't even really think straight. I just remember thinking this is not normal this isn't an animal this isn't something that i want to see this isn't something that i should be hearing right now and then just as quick as it came it stopped and it was like if you're listening to headphones super loud and then all of a sudden you just pause it and it's just that dead silence i remember that happening it it stopped and then it was like a dead silence well while this was going on like i said i was just looking straight ahead i couldn't 
I, I couldn't move. I couldn't turn. I couldn't do anything. All I remember was I can't move. I just need to focus on my peripheral vision. So at that time I had seen these two, it wasn't yellow, but it was like a dark yellow. It was like, like on Jurassic park. If you've ever seen Jurassic park, the original, the first one where he has that mosquito inside of that syrup stuff on his cane, it was like that color. It was like a dark yellow, kind of a goldish color. And I remember seeing two of them over to my left. Well, as soon as that noise stopped, my friend Jay on my left hand side grabbed my arm and just, I could just tell he was terrified because he grabbed my arm. Not even a half a second later, my friend D to the right of me, who again is six foot eight, 375, almost 400 pounds at this time, jumps up faster than I've ever seen anybody jump up in my life. And he just starts screaming just at the top of his lungs, just, oh, and you can hear him just echoing over the lake. And I'm like, you know, I'm still like in shock kind of. And I turn back over to my left, look at my friend Jay and tell him like, let's get out of here. And as I look over to him, right where I saw those lights, they weren't there anymore. Looking back on it now, I realized they weren't lights, it was eyes. And right where those eyes were, I looked over in that area. It was across the lake, but it was only probably 60, 70 yards away. And there was trees on the other side of it that ran right down along to the channel. So where it was at was probably 20 yards away from the channel, which, you know, on the other side of the channel is the house. And it's silent. It's still out there. There's no wind. There's clear skies. I mean, nothing's blowing around. Nothing like that. I remember looking over and where the lights were, I see this huge tree just bend over. It went from like being up, like if you were walking and then you just fell on your face. It was kind of like that that motion. It just kind of like fell down like that. As that's happening, I look over to my left and I see that Jay's not there anymore. So I'm like, where's he at? So I turn back around to see my friend D and I see Jay running through the yard. He's already halfway, you know, back to the fence to go back out of the, the area to get back to the car. So I jump up and my friend D's already, you know, pretty much going at this point. We, we just left everything there. Obviously, we, we weren't worried about none of that. I remember jumping up and my friend D was probably five feet away from me, ahead of me. You know, and he's starting to run. And Jay, at this point, he's already to the fence because, I mean, he booked it. So we get taken off and he's in front of me. I started to pass him. And I remember clear as day, he just yelled. Like, don't leave me. And the way he said it was like he was crying. Like, he was just so terrified that he was going to be back there by himself. And at the time, like, I feel horrible, but like, I felt the same way. And I was thinking, you know, it's either you or me. You know, you're almost seven foot tall. You have better chance than I do from this thing. But then at the same time, I'm thinking in my head, it's going to see him and think that's too much of a fight. So it's going to run right past him and go for me. Well, we're running, and at this point, the the lake's over to my left, and the house is to the right. The moon was out that night, so you couldn't really see much like over in the woods area by the channel because it was just so dark in that area which with where the moon was at. But when you looked at the house, you could see the house really well because you had the moonlight, and then not only the moonlight, but you had the moonlight from the lake shining back at the house, which looked like it was glowing. It was very easy to see. We're running through the yard to go back to the fence. And then all of a sudden, it, just as loud as you can imagine, somebody hitting, like pounding on the side of the house. Something just started pounding from the house, just pounding, just beating on it. I look over at the house as I'm running. And I don't know if it was for me running and, you know, the shaking from running or what, but it looked like the house was pulsating or like shaking with the pounding on the side of the house. And at the time, I remember as I was running, I had this smell, but it wasn't like a foreign smell to me. It smelled like, you know, a channel or, you know, dirty water or like swamp water or something like that. You know, and and occasionally you smell that out there when it's been humid or it's been hot or, you know, stuff like that. Somebody's been walking around in the channel and, and just stirring up that mud. But it wasn't like an overpowering smell. I definitely remember that there being that smell. It just wasn't like a overwhelming where I was just like, man, you know, what's that smell? Anyway, uh, I have that smell and I'm running and I see that the house, I see it, what looked like is shaking. 
something's just pounding just as hard as can be. I kind of turn my head to look back and see if there's anything chasing us. And I see my friend D's face and his eyes are just the size of baseball is just running. And he's just, just asking me like, wait for me. Just, just wait, please. And I'm still running and I'm, you know, back and I'm like, just hurry up. Like, come on, we got to go. So we get to the fence and you could only go over or under. And we would always go under because there's a little area of the fence that you could just pull it up because people would go under there all the time. I'm just sitting there thinking to myself, he's going to have a really hard time getting under this fence quickly. If I don't help him, he might get stuck and I don't want that on my conscience. So I remember as if I were playing baseball, I remember sliding to the fence. I just sprinted and I slid to the fence because there was a, a good gap. I'd say probably at least a foot where the fence was kind of curled up just from being pulled up and things. And I got my foot up underneath it. And I remember pulling the fence up and helping him under. I held the fence up from the ground. He went underneath it. And then he grabbed my hand and pretty much just ripped me up. And then we were running through the Indian burial ground. And, and at this time, I'm like, whatever this thing is, it's ridiculously fast. It's way faster than we are. We're in a very dark place right now that's covered in woods. And we still have to go over another fence and through another cemetery. So I'm thinking like, you know, this is it. Like if, if there's the time, this is it. This is the end of the road for me. And I just remember telling myself, just don't look back. Just keep running. Keep going. Just keep going. So right when I think that, I'm like, man, Jay's way ahead of us. Like I'm thinking he got in his truck and he left. Like we're going to have to run until we can't run no more because I'm thinking he just left us there. So we're running and we finally jump up over the, the fence to the cemetery and we're going through the cemetery part and we finally get to the end of the cemetery and we get to pavement and we, there's a street light. So that right there, just that street light. I remember feeling so comforted by that street light because at least I'm in the light is what I was thinking. And when I tell you we were sprinting, I set a few records in middle school for my track team, but that night I think I would have set the world record and uh, he wasn't far behind me. And this is a big boy I'm talking about. I just remember just running and running and we get to the truck and Jay's already in the truck. It's already started. And he's yelling like, let's go, come on, let's go. And I remember jumping in the back of the S10 and before D was even in, I mean, he had like one leg in the door wasn't even shut and Jay starts kicking gravel and just booked it out of there. It was probably 20 minutes into the ride. We we're riding, you know, back to town. Finally, I broke the silence, you know, and Jay was driving. And you could visibly see his hand shaking. He was chain smoking cigarette after cigarette. And you could just visibly see him shaking. And he was white as a ghost. Finally broke the silence. And I was like, are, are we going to talk about what just happened? And he said, I'd rather not. He said, I don't know what that was. And he turned around and looked me dead in the eyes. And he said, but whatever it was, it was evil. He turned right back around. And he said, where are you guys going? I told him, you know, drop me off at one of my other buddies' house where my car's at. And he said, D, where are you going? And D asked me if I could give him a ride home. So I said, yeah. And, you know, Jay dropped us off at my truck. We ended up leaving and going back home. On the way home, I asked D, like, what do you think that was, man? He just told me, you know, he's like, I don't know what it was, man. He's like, the first thing I thought was, a, you know, Bigfoot. I was like, well, is that why you jumped up and started yelling like that? You know, because I was just joking around at the time because, you know, he's a big dude. I was like, is that your, you know, your cousin or something you're yelling at? He just kind of looked at me serious like that wasn't something to joke about. And I'm trying to make light of the situation. I think that that's just my natural way of, of trying to make light of situations or, you know, calm myself down is by humor. <laughs> that's all he said about that. And then I dropped him off. And I remember that night. I just didn't go to sleep because, I mean, by this point, you know, it's already 4, 4.30 in the morning. So I'm like, I'm just going to stay awake. You know, I'm just going to just stay awake the rest of the day and I'll sleep good tomorrow night. Well, I didn't sleep good the next night or the next night. And it's weird because at the time, I didn't know what a dog man was. I knew what a Bigfoot was. But at the time, I was one of the people, which is, seems like most of the people, was just thinking, oh, you know, they're not anywhere around here. They're, you know, way out in the wilderness where nobody ever goes out and where nobody's at, just out in their own area. Every once in a while, maybe you'll have a, you know, a strangler go off course, but nowhere near here, nowhere near home. I actually ended up 
developing a pretty bad sleeping problem, uh, insomnia, and actually had to get put on prescription medication for it. I didn't have nightmares. I didn't have visions of what happened or flashbacks or anything like that. I just, ever since that night, I had a feeling of if it's dark, I need to be awake. I need to be alert because there are things in the dark. You know, there are these things out there. And I think it was just my body's way of telling me, like, you need to to protect yourself. You need to be cautious. You know, once I graduated high school, I worked third shift for almost 10 years just because I switched. Like, it was almost overnight that night I switched to being a night person. I'd go to sleep at 9, 10 o'clock in the morning, and I'd wake up in the evening time. And that's just how I lived. That's how I worked. And I was fine with that because I wanted to be awake during the nighttime because I knew during the daytime I could be sleeping and it's during the daytime there's people around. I don't have to worry as much during the day, during the light. I think I did realize, but I think I just wanted to put it in the back of my head. I didn't want to make myself think that I was crazy. and I didn't want to have to tell anybody else that story and have them think I was crazy. So I just wrote it off as I just developed insomnia somehow. I didn't tell anybody about it for years. I ended up telling my parents one night, we we're talking about my buddy D and this and that. And, and I ended up telling them and, you know, my mom was like, I wouldn't be surprised, you know, which was surprising to me because I figured she would have been like, oh, it was just all in your head. You know, it was something else. There's a logical explanation for this. But no, she didn't say that. I got, I got that from my dad, which is what I was expecting. And then even, you know, to this day, I'll try to talk to my friends about it, which Dee's more open to talk about it. He'll just not really go into the details. He'll just say something like, oh, you know, that, that was crazy. Or to this day, if I bring it up to Jay, he will walk away from me. He will not talk to me about it. We actually had a buddy of ours pass away about eight months ago now. That night, we were having a little celebration of his life, and we were having a few drinks, and you know, I asked him, I was like, Hey man, you, you remember that night when we went fishing? He just stood up and he said, we're not going there, dude. He's like, I've, I've told you, I'm not talking about that. I don't want to talk about that. And he walked away and wouldn't talk about it. So looking back on it now, realizing that he was over to my left and whatever I saw was to my left, I wouldn't be surprised if whatever it was, he was looking right at it because it would have been directly in his line of vision the way he was acting as fast as he got out of there. This is the kind of dude that he's not scared of stuff. You know, he was a tough guy. He wasn't scared of this, didn't believe in that. He was just that guy. So it was very unlike him, uncharacteristic of him to just look so visibly shook up. And you could tell he wasn't joking. He wasn't trying to make it seem worse than what it was. He was terrified and he was as white as a sheet and he was visibly shaking like a leaf. I never understood, you know, why he was so shaken up about it, why he was so worked up like he was. And then thinking back on it now, realizing all this stuff, putting all the pieces to the puzzle together, I realized he was probably looking right at this thing, whatever it was. So now it makes perfect sense why he is the way that he is and why he won't talk about it. I can see in his face as soon as I mention it, I've only mentioned it about three or four times ever, but you can just see it's like a light switch. He just, his face goes blank. He gets a serious look on his face and he just literally will get up and walk away. So I think that really speaks a lot to that night, his reaction. My friend D he'll talk about it and he'll just kind of, you know, go, yeah, that was crazy. That was wild. I've tried asking him. I've tried to sit down and, and just have a logical talk. Like, let's, let's talk about all the details. What do you remember? You know, I'll tell you what I remember. And he just don't ever want to go that far into it. I wish he would talk about it because that that could help him, you know, and just let him know and tell him what what kind of what you told me. If it wanted to hurt us, it would have. It it had us. It could have got us. We were way far away from anywhere. It had us dead to rights, but it didn't want us. You know, it just wanted to scare us. Like I said, it was only my parents that I've ever told. And then my wife, I actually told her about it. I didn't even know at the time that she watches your show. She always watched your show way before me. And I was telling her about this. I don't know what brought it up. I think she actually told me about one of your episodes. And I remember hearing it and hearing what one of the people said. And I was like, man, that's weird. I was like, that reminds me of this one time. And I told her the story about what happened. And she told me, she's like, well, I think that was a dog, man, you know? 
and I was like, a dog, man. I was like, what's a dog, man? And then I was like, like a werewolf? I was like, come on. I was like, you know, I, I didn't know anything about it. <laughs> I was one of those people that didn't know anything about it, thought it was crazy. You know, a werewolf, like whatever. <laughs> and then she kind of, you know, started getting into it and, and talking and things. And like I mentioned to you before, I'm a Christian. And, you know, I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And it talks in the Bible about Nephilim and, you know, fallen angels and things like that. So I always believe that there was those kind of things out there. And once she started telling me about this and I was listening to your episodes and kind of looking into it, that's when I realized like, wow, that is, you know, what I've seen. That's exactly what I've seen. Everything fits to the T, you know, everything that these people are saying, it all lines up with what I saw, what I heard. So then that's when it really opened it up to me. And, and I started listening to your show, listening to all these people and they were all just so eerily similar to my experience. And I, you know, I told her, I was like, I think you might be right. That's when she was like, you should reach out to them and, and share your experience and this and that. And I was kind of weary, honestly, it took about six to eight months, I think, uh, before I wrote in. But for me, it was like I was mentioning earlier, you know, it just, it really helps me hearing these other people tell their stories because it makes me realize I'm not crazy. You know, there are other people out there that go through this. People need to, to know, people need to have the knowledge that these things are out there, but you don't need to, to fear them, nor do you need to go looking for them. What would you say was the most frightening aspect of your encounter? Hearing that vocalization and not seeing it or actually seeing it eventually? Honestly, I'd probably say the hearing it part, just because whatever it was, it froze me and my friends too. Because I remember the one thing that they did say, you know, they agreed with me that night in the truck. I was like, when it was yelling, I was like, I couldn't move. And they both said, neither could I. And then I was like, I was stuck. But I think to me, that was the scariest part because I just remember I couldn't really think very straight, but I remember a few thoughts. Obviously, the one thought was, this isn't normal. This isn't an animal. This is something way worse. And the other thought was, I can't move. This thing could be charging at me right now and I can't move. So I think for me, just being that out of control, like not having any control of myself, the being able to move, you know, being able to talk, yell, to do anything. That was by far the scariest part to me, just being stuck, being frozen like that, not being able to move. Because I remember thinking, you know, this thing could be running at us. This thing could be getting closer and I can't do anything. Like it could just do whatever it wants to me because I'm stuck here. Yeah, that sounds like something out of a nightmare. You just told us that you're a religious guy, Ben. How'd that encounter affect your faith? Well, I was young at the time, so I was about 16 when this happened. So I was still ignorant to a lot of stuff. And at the time, I didn't really put two and two together because I wasn't, you know, that well versed in the Bible and things and all the details of it at that age. But I do remember thinking like, God saved me on that one. Like he had my back this time, you know, as I grew older, I always had that experience in the back of my head, but I would always try to keep it there and never let it come out. I think it was my way of suppressing it and my way of kind of making myself think that it didn't happen. But I definitely, you know, over the years, getting more into the Bible and, and hearing all these things about Nephilim and, and the fallen angels and things like that, it just made me realize more and more, you know, that's what it was. I still didn't realize at the time that it was potentially a dog man. You know, I just thought it was some kind of creature like that. Back then, I didn't know what those creatures were. I only knew what a Bigfoot was. And then I started looking more and more into it once my wife brought it up. And then I started looking into Dogman, the Bigfoot, and and things like that. So if anything, I think it made my faith even stronger. You know, no one talks about this in the Bible and that, you know, these things really are here. Jesus was protecting me that night. So if anything, I think it, it actually made my faith stronger. Oh, good. Yeah, it's always good to have positives that you take away from an experience like that. That's right. You told us about the insomnia you suffered through due to that encounter and the medicine you were prescribed. You didn't do it, but did you ever think about trying to get professional help? Kind of, but no. I mean, I did, but then it was the whole, what am I going to say to this person? How am I going to say it? Should I say it was just like some kind of actual animal so that it's more believable? Or should I really go into it and tell them? It wasn't a question of whether I wanted to because I did. 
it was a question of, are they going to put me in a nut house? Are they going to think I'm literally insane? It was more of a, how are they going to look at me? What are they going to think if I tell them this instead of, a, you know, I'm just going to tell them and, and hopefully they help me. That never really crossed my mind because I knew that's not what it was going to be. I figured it was going to be a, they think something's even worse than me or there's something you know traumatic going on. And I just didn't feel like going through whatever tests or, you know, surveys, questions they had to ask me. I just, I felt like it would just be easier if I just told them, you know, I can't sleep. I don't know what it is. And you know, I would tell them, you know, I just, for some reason, my body feels like it needs to be awake when it's dark outside. And they would say, you know, are you scared of the dark? Are you having nightmares? And I'll just tell them, you know, no, I'm not having nightmares. I'm not scared of the dark. I just feel like I need to be awake when it's dark outside. So I know I would never tell them, you know, I had a, some kind of experience with anything like that. Just because again, one, I didn't really want to relive it. And two, I didn't want to relive it and then be told I was crazy. And what I saw, I didn't see or what I did hear, I didn't really hear. So I just felt like addressing the insomnia problem and, and not really addressing the actual issue. I don't blame you. Yeah, don't blame me at all. Cause yeah, that could have gone in a lot of bad directions, just like you just mentioned. Do you think you were dealing with a supernatural entity that night, or do you think what you encountered was a flesh and blood creature? I think it was an actual creature, just because seeing it move and seeing the eyes beforehand and where it was, I mean, if they were lights, they wouldn't have moved. They wouldn't have just disappeared. It was definitely the eyes and then the seeing it part. And then just the whatever it was hitting the house, something was beating on that house so hard that it was visibly shaking. So I don't know if it was hitting it from the other side of the house, if it had a way to get inside the house and it was hitting, you know, like from the inside of the walls or what. If I had to bet on it, I would I would bet all my money that it was an actual physical creature. Of course, we're never going to know for sure, but I'm pretty sure you are right. You obviously feel horrible about running past D the way you did. Does that still weigh into your thoughts when you think about what happened that night? Not really. I mean, kind of. I look back at it, and the way I look at it is, well, Jay just completely left us without a hesitation, without a question on his mind. So at least I didn't do that. Once I initially ran past him, I helped him under the fence. You know, I helped him get through and things. So I think that kind of made up for it, and, and I, I don't think he's got any or had any bad feelings towards me just because I made sure to help him and I made sure to stay as close to him as I felt comfortable. Well, I mean, it was a panic situation. You just handled it the best way you knew how. So I'm glad to hear that you're not beating yourself up for it because yeah, that wouldn't be any good. Right. You told us what that vocalization sounded like, but how long did it sustain? Do you think there was any way a human could have made that sound? Oh, no, no, not at all. It was entirely way too low. Well, my friend who made that noise afterwards, he was yelling at the top of his lungs as loud as he could, and it was nowhere even close to as loud as this thing was. And, and granted, we were on a lake, so sound travels a lot faster and a lot louder over lakes, but he was on the lake too, and he was making that noise, and it was nowhere even close. And when he was yelling, it was definitely, you could tell it was a person yelling. When this other thing was yelling, it sounded like a mix between, like I said, a Rottweiler, a wild boar, a screaming lady. And I mean, it was just like snarly and it would kind of like bark. It was just insane. There's no way a human could have made that noise. There's no way it was a recording, anything like that. You can't really explain it. You can't really, really have somebody understand it unless you experience it. I can sit here and you know explain it in all the detail I can, but... Unless you really hear it yourself, you can't really understand. It was just that loud and that frightening and that it just sounded evil and just demonic and snarling. Just, oh, it was horrible. Oh, I'm sure it was. Yeah. You know what they say about a picture being worth a thousand words? Yeah. There's no way to do it any justice when you try to describe what it sounded like. So I get it. Exactly. You had no idea what it was you were dealing with that night. Do you think that experience would have been easier to deal with if you had known what it was? No, I think that's actually what really helped me 
was that I was so ignorant about what it was. I didn't have that knowledge about it. I don't think I was as scared as I would have been if I would have known what it was. I was still pretty young at the time, you know, 16. If I had known what it was, I think I would have been way more terrified. I think it was better for me having the experience, you know, coming to terms with the experience. And then years later, actually finding out what it was, as opposed to having that experience and knowing what it is at the time. I know they have all different kinds of things they can do. You know, if it would have known that I knew what it was at the time, maybe it would have been worse and it would have tried to scare me even more. I don't know. A hundred percent of me feels like it was better this way than to have gone through it knowing what it was. Ignorance is bliss sometimes. And I think that's the, the best ignorant moment of my life. It sure sounds like it. Yeah, sometimes it is best not to know. (laughs) I understand. Considering how easily that dogman could have remained hidden, why do you think it made its presence known to you and your friends the way it did? Honestly, I think it was, it knew that we were about to leave. And I think that's its last way of scaring us, making it think that it was going to chase us. I think it wanted us to know that it wasn't just making a noise, that it was actually there. I think it was more of this, like a territorial thing. Like they just want to scare you. They feed off, they get off on just scaring you. They want to terrify you to your core. And I think that was just part of its game. It was, you know, it did that, that God awful screaming, that noise. I think it, once it saw Jay, you know, taking off, it knew that we were about to follow suit. And I think it just wanted to scare us even more, make us think that we were, you know, being chased. So we would just run even faster in terror. It's good you understand that, because, yeah, I'm pretty sure that was what was going on. I'm sure it's not lost on you that it's believed that areas where there are Native American burial grounds are more likely to have dogmen activity than places where they can't be found. Do you believe in that idea? I do, definitely. I've seen, or I've heard, uh, many stories of people talking about, you know, their experiences and it being close to a Native American burial ground or uh, site or, you know, something like that, just with having my experience there and seeing all these other experiences in somewhere, you know, a, a very similar setting, it just makes me believe it all that more. You know, I've actually looked into a lot of things and I've, I've done research and stuff, and it's not just dogman that is that same occurrence. It's Bigfoot and, and other, you know, things that just seem to go hand in hand with these places, with, with these Indian burial sites. So, yeah, I definitely 100% agree with that and believe that that's a fact. It does make you wonder. Yeah, there just might be something to that. Are you mad at that dog man for scaring you the way it did? No, I wouldn't say I'm mad at it because I think that's what it would want. If anything, I I actually think I'm glad for the experience just because you're that much more enlightened on the detail. Uh, I've already got the experience out of the way. You know, it's would have been better if I just would have never had it at all. But I think it does, you know, make you stronger. If you do go through something like that and you realize I was right there, I had that experience, I lived through it, I guess see another day. You know, thank the Lord for that. I think it's just one of those things that just like, you know, if somebody gets in a really bad car wreck, you're still alive, everything's fine. You get to see another day. You can relate to other people that were in the same situation, but you live through it and everything's fine. You know, you don't have to worry about it. I'm just glad it happened to me when I was young and I didn't know what it was at the time. If I would have known what it was, I don't know if I would have been, you know, in that much more fear and I just would have just stayed there and not been able to move. I'm actually probably glad that it happened the way it did happen and not in a different way. I like the way you think. I'm impressed. Did you and your friends ever go back there after you had that encounter that night? I went back one time about four years ago during the broad daylight. I would never go back out there at night or in the evening or by myself ever again. It's hard to explain. Like I would always have an eerie feeling being back there even when I was little just because of the the area, the cemetery and the Indian burial ground. Before I even knew what happened in the house, I just had a eerie feeling, you know, like it was just I need to be, you know, extra kind of cautious about this area. So that was the only time that I had went back. I'm not sure if my friends went back. I highly doubt it. D may have been around the area just because his aunt lived right up the channel there. But if he actually went to the actual location, I doubt it. I have looked it up on Google Maps. 
because it's really kind of hard to visualize how everything happened unless you really know the layout. Like I was trying to explain to my wife and she's like, well, where was this at? And how was this set up? Was this behind you? Is this over here? And it was weird because we tried looking it up a few different ways, like by the address or whatever, it wouldn't show anything. And it would say that it was not available and this and that. Well, finally we had to go back, you know, and then I had to drag it over and drag it over and I, I finally found it. So I got it there and, you know, I'll send you a picture and I'll put some X's where we were sitting at on the property. And, and once you see that, it's kind of, it's a lot easier to kind of picture what happened if you actually see the setup. Well, thanks for sending that to me. For anyone listening to the YouTube version of tonight's show, I've got that photo, that screenshot posted right now. With that in mind, Ben, what should we be looking at? So I'll put three X's where we were sitting at, and then I'll put something over to my left where I saw the eyes and where I saw the movement. From that picture, you should, you'll should you be able to see where the house is at in the garage. And then I'll try to outline like the seawall and the fence. I'll send like a separate screenshot of like that whole area where the road is and the cemetery and the post office that way you can kind of see the road that led us up into there and then kind of have a visual of just like the whole layout the whole area yeah i appreciate you doing that i'll get those posted so the listeners can check them out having said that it's about time for us to get out of here but before we do do you have any closing comments you'd like to share yeah i would say if you're intrigued by these if you've never had an experience for some people it might seem you know like a thrill or the next best thing other than a house of horror or a horror movie it's not the kind of experience that you really want to have that you think you do but then once it actually comes down to it you don't you know it's one of those things where like if somebody you know decides they want to get a tattoo and they really think they do and then they go to get the tattoo and that needle hits their skin and they're like oh man you know, I wish I hadn't done that or I don't want to do this. It's kind of like that, <laughs> except you don't have a say in, oh, I don't want to do this anymore if you do get in that situation. So I would just say be cautious, be careful what you wish for. If you are a believer, I would say, you know, just make sure that you pray and pray and you don't want to experience that. I'm just going to tell you right now, you may think you do, but you don't. And if you do have that experience, you're going to wish that you hadn't. Well, Ben, that all sounds like great advice to me. And of course, I can't thank you enough for coming on and sharing the details of that experience with us. I really appreciate it. Oh, yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me. I think it's really important for people to get their stories out so it can help them. And I also think it'll help other people as well. It normally does. Yeah, that's normally how it works out. Thanks again so much for your time. Have a great night.